It's the season of color and bounty. Fall is here, and that means it's time to harvest, to review the trials and triumphs of the growing season, and prepare for the coming cold. We're here with a bushel basket of examples and sage advice on this Harvest Moon edition of Great Gardening, straight ahead. Every tree has a moment when it shines. That's called money wart or creeping jenny. You can go in and do a rejuvenating pruning. Forage and feed for our native pollinator population. A garden really gives you peace of mind. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. It's the autumn equinox, but the garden season isn't over yet. We hope you're still enjoying the bounty and beauty of what you've grown. We begin tonight with a welcome to our expert advisors, horticulturist and educator Bob Olin and professional gardener Tom Casper. Gentlemen, it has been three months since we were together on the set of Great Gardening and uh, now we have a full hour to tap your brains for all the additional knowledge you've gained over the season. So the, the lead in, you said sage advice, <laughs> which is another word for old time. That's right. <laughs> well, Thank you, Pam. if the garden boot fits. <laughs> <laughs> no, we uh, are so glad to have you guys back. And uh, what a season we've had. But three months has gone by. Three Isn't months. Has, and they have been very interesting ones, have they not? Very interesting yeah. summer mm -hmm. we've had. Yeah. Ideal in many ways and a little bit troublesome in others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good moisture, good heat, good lots of sunshine, and uh, you know it's led to some nice crops. Yeah, as we, uh, examples here, and yeah. we have a lot of them to talk about as yeah. well. We also welcome our phone volunteers, the St. Louis County Master Gardeners. They are standing by to answer your called-in questions tonight. Please give them a try at 218-788-2844 or you can call them toll free at 877-307-8762. You can also email your questions to askgardening at wdse.org. Well, we want to start uh, with just an overview of this season. And, and to begin, I think I want to ask you guys, what is it that really stands out from the 2016 garden season? You know, it really has to be this uh, combination of bright sun and lots of moisture. And then, of course, the month of July, which had a couple of very difficult storm right. periods in there. And uh, I, I think that uh, all the data, weather data, climate data, indicates that we're going to have more intense rainfall events, but not spiking summer temperatures. And that was kind of classic for this year. We really didn't have the intense heat, but boy, we sure had a plenty of rain and still continuing, particularly in some areas. Yeah. Things, I mean, some of the, the flowers in the garden still look beautiful, Tom. Yeah, and, and plenty of sun with that, that rain. combination. Which is a, an odd combination, but we had lots of nice sunny days and then adequate moisture throughout the season, if not sometimes too much. But um, I, I think what stands out to me for the gardening season is really the, the, the amount of those that we had that led to really lots of successful gardens and lots of opportunities to enjoy it. So, yeah. It was kind of the best of all worlds and the worst of all worlds. If you had problems mm -hmm. uh, and you're watching your neighbor that got missed by the storms and, and talking about how tremendous the season was, you feel a little bit bad about that. I know for many of our people, myself included, had to set down the hole in July and uh, pick up the chainsaw more than I really wanted to, but nonetheless, it was a remarkable year. Okay, a little nod to Dickens, the best of times, the worst of times, and, uh, and off we go to take a longer look at the season. <laughs> as mentioned, weather conditions, as they often do, took us by surprise. In mid-July, the damage was unprecedented in Duluth and surrounding areas. Recovery from the summer storms may take some time yet. We offer ideas on replanting, and here's Bob with more on that. With all of the storm damage we've had, there's going to be a lot of new trees and shrubs planted in our landscapes. People should really think about two groups of trees. Those are a little bit smaller in stature. They're going to grow to about 15 or 20 feet in height. And then some of our native climax species that are going to grow considerably taller, 40 or 50, 60 feet in height. This is a good example of trees in our urban landscape where we've got our native basswood and then we've got spruce are taller stature trees and those are 50, 60 feet in height. When people are going to be planting some of the larger species, which are beautiful in this area, select our native species 
and a very, very good site. We want good, deep, well-drained soils. We don't want ledge rock. We don't want any moisture to accumulate. We want a good, deep root system for these larger trees. Here's a good example of a shorter stature tree, the Japanese tree lilac, and then of course the power lines and then the black ash in the background. And you can see the difference in size. You can see the vulnerability of some of our overhead lines to larger stature trees. This is the reason why we're really planting uh, shorter trees, particularly in the vicinity of uh, any overhead lines. This is a great replacement tree, Japanese tree lilac. You can see the flower buds here. This is going to be magnificent within about uh, 10 days. Nice in the landscape, nice to look at, good and hardy, and uh, they're not gonna have any problems if we get a high wind or another storm. Uh, we've also got some nice shorter stature maples, the Titarian maple, the uh, mountain maple, the Janella maple. So we've got some maple species that also are gonna be smaller in stature and very appropriate where we've got limited space. Here are examples of a couple of good evergreen replacement species that aren't going to get too large for us in the landscape. Juniper and our arborvitae or northern white cedar. This is just about a mature arborvitae here which will grow 15 to 20 feet in height and not going to cause too much of a problem. Good in winter hardy, prunes up nicely if you elect to. If not, the natural form is, is very adequate as well. Uh, the only thing you need to be aware of is the deer love to prune them as well. So if you have heavy deer pressure in your landscape, you might consider some other species. All right. Well, we have a whole list of trees that you might want to use uh, to replace some of the ones you lost. And Bob, we'll start out with some of those larger stature trees. I think here again we want to be very careful when we select them. I, I do would anticipate that we are going to see climatic conditions as we did this summer probably going to recur. So if you're going to plant larger trees, our maple, spruce, and pines, which are all uh, native to the area, I think you just have to make sure you've got plenty of room above and below. The root systems are pretty extensive. Uh, we, of course, want to avoid some of the faster growing species. As a rule of thumb, the faster a tree grows, the, uh, the weaker potentially it's going to be. So we take a look at balsam fir, or balsam poplar, and what people call popple in this area, aspen. Uh, the other one, uh, the, the um, ash trees, both black and green, even though they're native, we, of course, have had some occurrence with right. the emerald, emerald ash, ash borer. Borer. So sure. that's probably not a good choice for a tree species. Smaller trees, got a lot of options, and these are going to fit nicely or where you've got overhead wires or where you're, you've got exposed windy areas and you don't want them to be stamped off. But there are a number of uh, maple species that do grow just a little bit shorter. Uh, the Japanese tree lilac, beautiful bloom. Uh, the magnolia stellata, the star magnolia, really is a, uh, a larger shrub, and I think. But it's gorgeous. Yeah, it's in the gorgeous. Early spring. And we've got some hawthorns as well that really are very suitable. Small fruiting trees, our flowering crabs, add so much to the color in the spring landscape. We've got hardy cherries, we've got plums, uh, we've got pears and apples and other things that really are smaller fruiting trees that are very acceptable. Uh, looking at some of the evergreens which add winter interest as well as uh, summer, our northern white cedar, arborvitae, the juniper, mugo pine, uh, and many of these uh, dwarf conifers. So we have in the trade a lot of dwarf species and I think people should consider some of the shorter stature trees that aren't going to be quite as vulnerable to damage if you get these real windy conditions again. Right, and then of course uh, there are a lot of shrubs out there, Tom, that we might want to try and, and other things for uh, garden areas that may have been damaged. Yeah, Juneberry, uh, Chokeberry and Chokecherry, uh, Mock Orange, Lilacs, Ninebark, Highbush, Cranberry, Forsythia, yeah, uh, several of those not only provide um, beautiful plantings and flowers, but also can provide berries that can be used for uh, fresh eating or for jellies or jams or different things like that. So those are all good choices and you have some early season, mid season bloomers in there. And all generally, depending on the variety you choose, uh, most of them are very hardy for our northern climate. So right. good choices. Um, and of course, always uh, think about new perennial gardens yeah. and, and opportunities. And, and the really hot topic right now for gardeners and folks that are concerned about the bees and butterflies and other pollinator populations is to plant pollinator or butterfly gardens to attract. And lots of choices yeah. with perennials that you can put in butterfly gardens. We've yeah. talked about that. And they are beautiful gardens. And like you say, they help the pollinators. So. Exactly. 
Win-win there. Win-win. All right. <laughs> uh, we do have a lot of questions coming in, and but one of the things I know that we wanted to point out was with the storm damage, we also saw damage maybe to some of our fruits and vegetables. Yeah, we've got some changes in our fruit crops, and we've talked about some of these things in the past, but the apple harvest looks like it's going to be very good this year. However, got a few examples here. We we're seeing a lot of uh, russeting on apples. You can see this russeted appearance. And that really was um, some of the extreme temperatures that we that occurred in the rainfall right as the fruit was beginning to set. And then um, many small developing fruit was also impacted by hail. So this is actually hail damage. People think that they've got uh, anthracnose and other fungal disease, but really it doesn't take anything more than a little heavy rain. It doesn't have to really be icing, but anything that really pelted hard when that skin was very, very tender can cause this kind of damage uh, later in the season as the fruit is ripening. Okay, still good for applesauce though, right? Absolutely, <laughs> uh, applesauce cures a lot of problems on yes, our apple trees. Yes, we've heard that. Okay, let's get to some questions from some of our viewers. They're calling them in already. Gail from Woodland wants to know how to dry hydrangea and sedum, and as it happens, I brought a couple of my hydrangea that I and that sedum. I happened to dry and my sedum, but I, that isn't dried yet. So if no. you have if you have a tip on how to dry that one, too. Um, pretty easy to dry. Actually, both of them are pretty easy to dry. Suspending them upside down in a in a cool, dry area out of the direct sun, and you can really get them both to uh, to dry nicely and and last for a long time as a as a flor a floral arrangement or mm -hmm. a design in your. Uh, inside your house for all winter or even into next yeah. year. So Yeah, I just cut them and hung them up. And I do want to point out that this one here, I don't know if you can see the one on this side, was formerly my endless bummer. But now <laughs> I'm calling it endless summer again because it bloomed for me nice. after about three years. All that information you've taken from the show and applied. <laughs> <laughs> or I was just lucky. <laughs> you know, the interesting, I think it might have been that. <laughs> the interesting thing is so many people had success this year with endless summer. Right. And they've been so disappointed in previous years, so maybe that is one of the more remarkable aspects of this year's growing season. I don't know if it was sun, rain, combination of a warm winter last year, but uh, endless summer did pretty nicely this and year. And the other thing I noticed driving around in recent days and weeks is the hydrangea are gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous everywhere. Gorgeous everywhere, yeah. All yeah, the PGs look great. What a wonderful year for hydrangea. Okay. Judy in Duluth says she planted some rhododendrons this past spring. They're facing north and east, and she wants some recommendations for winter protection. Also was wondering about the use of anti-desiccant, and if so, when do I apply that, and should I burlap wrap these? So, so a lot of questions about the new rhododendrons. All that is good. Um, you know, and, and there is or can be some deer pressure on rhododendrons, and especially those flower buds as they're starting to to swell in the spring and the and the deer are at their hungriest point or biggest foraging point. Um, so certainly protecting them with burlap if she needs to or fencing. Um, Anti-desiccant probably isn't necessary. Um, hydrangeas seem to do very well in our climate, but I, th my biggest concern would be the deer pressure on them. So wrapping to help with that would be good, so. Okay. Good points, and Tom, people are considering replanting and where where uh, species should go or cultivars should go. And I think a northern exposure in northwest, people need to be aware that's gonna be mostly intense wind exposure. So if you've got a marginally hardy material or an evergreen that you wanna bring through, south and southeast, southwest are, are good choices for those types of tender materials. Okay, uh, Jean from Duluth, when do I cut back my peonies and iris? Uh, you can do that right now. Okay. And also the ideal time to divide both of those is right now as well, so. Excellent. Uh, we have one question with a picture and it's a crimson maple that was sent in by Kathy Kadlicek, I hope I'm saying that right. And it developed this big scar. She wants to know what might have caused it, how can she treat it, and will the tree die if it's untreated? You know, it's interesting. I, that I think she's referring to crimson king, which is actually a Norway maple. Okay. Uh, which is a little bit marginal hardy, except if you're close to the lake. This scar itself, what I find so encouraging, is you can see right around the edge there that it, the new tissue is beginning to close it naturally. So I think, uh, you know, you don't want to use pruning paints uh, or any kind of paint in particular on this. Uh, watch that lower end of the scar and make sure you're not trapping any water. That's somewhere, something where we'll oftentimes get water entry if uh, that is trapping, if there's a cavity there, take an X-Acto knife, clean it out so the water runs clean. 
If not, I think I would just let her go. She, it's doing reasonably well. That, that sure. new meristematic tissue is closing it off, or it'll just take a little bit of time. All right. Okay, more questions to come. In. And, and really, um, back to that just for yeah. a second. Um, probably on the south side of the tree where the damage is, it looks like, um, and probably a sun scald or, or something along that related to that damage. So certainly those young maples, and we've talked about it over the course of our 14 seasons here on, <laughs> on uh, which means I started at 11. Um, <laughs> 14, <laughs> you, did I miss a couple? That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, uh, but wrapping that in the yes. fall, that tree's too large now to wrap, not necessary, but those young purchase maples. In those that, first years, they yeah, need to be protected, yeah. right? So the, and we talked about replacing for storm damage also protecting those newly replaced trees from winter damage. Okay, so. good point. Well, there's nothing like fresh garden vegetables, and for those who grow their own, it's a job, but also a joy. Here's one example from South Range. Hi, my name is Liz DeLuca, and I'm in the township of Superior right on the Four Corners, and I have a huge vegetable garden that I'd like to show you. It is 65 by 23 feet. It's pretty big. I have five raised beds, the average is about four by eight. These are old watering cans for cattle and horses, and now we just use them for raspberries. The onions over here, they get about the size of softballs. So like we got a big onion here. I'm gonna pull this one up. I do love the Walla Wallas. It's a wonderful sweet onion, and it's delicious and go with any meal. And then I did plant some um, Red Rivers. It's a beautiful reddish purple onion. Really gorgeous, very good on sandwiches and salads. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hang the onions up on a line inside my garage and let them dry out. And then I'm gonna put them in a cool place in my home. They should last me for a long time. So here's one of my carrots. And one thing I really like about the carrots is that um, I love to make stew. And I'll use my onions and I'll use my potatoes. I did plant five um, different kinds of potatoes. These are russet potatoes. This one actually here is a fingerling. They're really long and narrow. They're delicious. They have real thin skin on there, easy to clean. So this one got a little bit exposed to the light. There's a little green color on the tip of this potato. So that's why it's important to hill them. So when I'm watering, if I see any potatoes erupting, then I just go ahead and rehill them. They come in all different sizes. Right here is a zucchini. I usually plant this every year. And crookneck. This is pretty big, but a lot of people like it. And they like to mix the two together. It makes a good stir fry. And um, so anyway, and then one, one thing I love about zucchini is that you can throw it in almost any dessert or dish. One thing I like about the plastic is that I don't, it will help me to do a lot less weeding. Put it right in between the rows and I like having cans around my, because it gets so windy, the wind will knock the plants over. It protects them. And sometimes that the plants, tomato plants get so big that the, the vines fall over and then I have to go and buy some gardening tape and tape the stem to the to the wire and that actually helps a lot and then you don't really see it because it, it's green and it matches the, the plant the stem right here I have some cabbage and I've had some problems with white moss they've been eating holes right through the leaves here it looks like Swiss cheese um, so what I did do I bought this white gardening cloth and what you do is you cover this and it keeps the moss away and rain and sun can go right through it. And it works beautifully. So I did put it on last week. So I can tell that my cabbage head is doing, doing great now. So I will have cabbage for sure. This year I actually canned, my mother helped me of course, 23 quarts of green beans. And I could have easily had a lot more, probably about 30 quarts. However, my mother said she didn't want to see another green bean and I don't blame her. Yeah, that's a lot of canning to do, but oh, those green beans. I hear that it was just a bumper crop this year for a lot of people for their green beans. It was a very good year. Of course, I don't know. I don't grow the crop because I got to oh. stoop down to pick it. <laughs> <laughs> just right for me. <laughs> just right for you. <laughs> well, uh, we know our, our floor director even s said he's, Ted Pelman said he's still picking beans because uh, they've had so many this year. So yes. good 
Good year for beans, uh, apparently a good year for pumpkins. Pumpkins are coming in, yeah. uh, squash are coming in, and for the year of the carrot, it was a great year for carrots Yeah, too. we have a number of carrot varieties that you grew for trial and also to spotlight the year of the carrot in the Northland. And so let's just take a look at those and you can tell us about them, Bob. A little sample here and we've got about 23 varieties in, some that are very productive hybrid varieties or more traditional orange varieties. And then uh, some that go back a little ways, some of the heirloom types. And one thing I have observed, uh, you know, Tom, this heirloom stuff, they get a little on the wild side, you know, <laughs> and uh, a lot of carrots will have a tendency to split, but I've noticed the, both the, the vigor in the green top stock as well as uh, some of the vigor and unusual uh, configurations in the roots. Uh, so if you got a friend or a child or someone that's, that's a little on the wild side, just consider them heirlooms, okay? <laughs> uh, a lot of the colors kind of fun, and this is actually nature's way of uh, actually protecting these root tissues. Uh, carrot is a biennial, so it's got to get the root tissue through the winter and into next year when it sets seed. And most of these colors are really laced with antioxidants that really do protect the cell tissue. And as we consume these as humans, uh, we actually increase the antioxidant capacity of the bloodstream when they're digesting. And theoretically, at least, it also provides some of that protective effect for us. So again, once again, eat your vegetables. We've heard that before, but great year for carrots. Is it true they're good for your eyes? It's very interesting. This is the one that's best for your eyes. Really? It contains lutein, which has been documented and published to prevent adult onset blindness. Actually, the original carrot, uh, that's kind of a myth. It was misinformation during the Second World War when the uh, the RAF, the Royal Air Force pilots of London, were having trouble against the Luftwaffe. They had an inferior aircraft, but when they were, got lucky and they scored a hit, they sent out all this information. It's because we're eating they carrots. They credited it to the carrot. And we have better eyesight. So we may not have a better <laughs> plane. We've got pilots with better eyesight because they're eating carrots. You get your history lesson here as well. <laughs> there we're we doing go. a documentary on that. <laughs> <laughs> but the lutein is still, it's been published many times sure. in reputable journals, is really very protective. They're all good. Mm -hmm. But they all contain antioxidants, but uh, the eyesight one, other than the yellow carrots, a little bit questionable. Well, thanks for sharing those with us, and uh, glad to see a lot of different carrots growing. Um, more questions from our viewers. Here's one from Dennis in Eveleth. He has a couple of small red maples that are growing in his garden, and they have dark brown spots on the leaves, quarter inch to half inch in diameter. What might it be? Well, this year we did again see quite a bit of tar spot. And when you say uh, dark brown, brown spots, if they're brown and if, they're, uh, if you can see patterns in them, uh, then more than likely that may be a fungal disease called anthracnose. But we saw a lot, of, uh, a lot of tar spot this year, and I really think that's probably what he's dealing with there. And, and not, really not a about. lot of it. I mean, a lot of people's maple trees are already losing or dropping leaves yeah. without right. fall color. And, and have been for over a month. So really a lot of it and the ongoing problem with it. Is so. that gonna affect our color this season? You know, I think the color is gonna be really great okay. because uh, what really affects the color is the, the type of growing season. So I think the colors are gonna be spectacular. What you may wanna do if you've had a problem like Tom mentioned with the early uh, leaf drop, that is a sign the tree's under stress. Let's make sure we get all those leaves cleaned up and deep in the compost pile if you're an efficient composter or off your premises or to our good friends at the sanitary district where they are effective composters and uh, let's just not build some of that inoculum because the uh, the bacterial spores and the fungal spores are in the leaf tissue just super sanitation is about the best you can do the tree should be just fine okay we have a question with the picture and it's a vine that was sent in by mark of duluth he says uh, he has this mature 15-year-old Virginia creeper vine, and it's grown 20 feet high, completely covers a large trellis. Each year it blooms out healthy, but by midsummer it gets small brown spots about on about half the leaves, which dries them out and kills them. Any idea to you know, how to control that? Obviously, we just saw this picture here, and uh, it's, it's very difficult uh, to determine exactly what those brown spots look like. The fact that he said it was repetitive each year leads me to believe it's a fungal or bacterial infection. More than likely, it's a fungal infection. It's probably anthracnose. Probably is not impacting the overall health of the tree because there's a lot of green tissue here, or shrub in this case, vine. Uh, but if he's really concerned, a fungicide applied after the leaves have elongated early in the season and repeated, uh, there are a number of products that are labeled for use for that purpose. Okay. And, and similarly, good cleanup. Right. Um, in the fall, getting a lot of that inoculum out of the area. So. And Tom, what is this? Those yeah. are the berries <laughs> from, uh, or the fruit from uh, 
from the Virginia creeper vine. Yeah, a friend brought those in and uh, to show us and remind people that they're poisonous. Right. Don't yeah. eat them, they look like blueberries. Yeah, and, and Virginia creeper, and for folks that haven't grown that or aren't familiar with that vine, outstanding vine for our climate, very, very hardy. Aggressive grower though, and, uh, and will grab onto things and can potentially do damage to structures, so you really wanna be careful where you grow it. Yeah, okay, you know, Ron. You bring up a real good point, if I could mention, anything that's fruiting berries right now, including uh, our buckthorn, uh, does not make a pie you wanna consume. Yeah. Be a little careful. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the early, the better fruit came earlier in the season. That's folks. right. Ron from Ely wants to know when to harvest his apples. He has Harold Red. Am I saying that right? Apple tree, and should he wait till after the first frost? I think the first frost is a little bit of just an indicator that it's going to be later in the season. They don't. They're not frost dependent to mature. A couple of guidelines: uh, if the fruit separates easily from the stem. You don't have to tug at it. That's usually a pretty good idea. Color on the outside of the skins, a good idea. If when you cut in, obviously you cut them, and if you don't have the sugar content, if we go later into the season, we build more sugar content. That's why we want a healthy tree with good green leaves as long as we can. And the fact that the frost, I think, is more co coincidental with the fact that we were harvesting it later in the season. Okay. So it doesn't need a frost to be sweeter. It does not need a frost, and you want to be very careful. Frost is uh, 30 to 32 degrees. A freeze at 28 degrees can actually destroy a lot of the fruit, so okay. they have to come off. Don't wait too long on those. Okay. Uh, another picture with a question, and this is a weed that um, someone sent us a picture of. It was growing about seven feet tall in her yard. I believe this is Patty's mom, whose name is escaping me right now. But, um, and we also we have a little uh, a little example of it. I don't know. Okay. I, I might stump you guys because we didn't talk about this. But you bring us um, in surprises <laughs> all the time. But this is a piece of that weed grows seven feet tall, does not flower, and um, really took hold in Betty's yard. Thank you. For reminding me <laughs> of Betty's name. You know the, the what do you flowering think? and the um, the seed heads. Uh, they do look a lot like amaranth. What uh, I'm not so sure about the um, big the, leaves and the dentated, the serrated leaves. That's not characteristic of that huge family. So, uh, you got any thoughts, Tom? That's what I, I think it's a member of the amaranth family do as you? well. Yeah. Okay. Um, by by the the look of the seed, seed head. head so. I recently heard just within the last week or two that there's a problem with it, an invasive amaranth. It's very possible. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's that's it. Uh, seven feet tall and, the, and of course pigweeds in that family and actually you talk about a growing season I have seen pigweed that is uh, five or six feet tall which is hard to imagine. Wow. Those little itty bitty plants yeah. in June can get pretty powerful. Yeah. <laughs> but this may be one of the invasive types. All right. Well there you go Betty. We're not sure but Interesting. Thanks for sharing that with us. All right. Each summer, devoted gardeners gather with club members in small groups all across the Northland to display their very best blooms. A garden club's annual flower show is a special day for gardeners to take pride in their efforts. Here's just one example. The theme was Carnival of Colors for the 27th annual flower show of the Eveleth Vale Garden Club in early August. That was evidenced in the dazzling display of dahlias in an assortment of hues. Beautiful, delicate begonias were shown for both their color and diverse forms. Flowers range from the unique to more common, including the bloom of a holiday cactus, a shocking pink hollyhock, this daylily, and the ever-popular and rugged Rugosa Rose all of which made for some tough choices when it came time to judge the entries. So I know you guys have been called on many times to judge garden, garden club shows and whatnot. I mean, I mean that's a great example of uh, all the effort that uh, club members put in to you know, have an annual event to grow beautiful Excellent. flowers. Yeah. And you know, we kind of have a little bit of this back to the future. I, I really like to see we're going back. At one time, garden club shows and flower shows were a mainstay of many, many communities, yes. the small county fairs and so forth. And we seem to see a little bit of renaissance, a little revival, which is kind of fun. Back to the simple pleasures. Exactly. Yeah. Well, children, too, are getting more in touch with nature and their health 
through gardening. And Tom, you took part in some harvest festivals recently. Tell us about those. These pictures are great. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couple of uh, the different schools that I've been to lately, North Shore Elementary on the right and uh, um, Lester Park Elementary on the left. I don't know if pe people can see it, but that cucumber in the front has a little smiley yeah. face <laughs> on it. <laughs> and there were lots of those kinds of fun things and, and Stowe School had their harvest festival in St. James. Here's a couple of pictures just from today. Um, at Congdon Park Elementary, you can see the, the little guy on, in the picture on the right with all those things he grew. Um, just a third grader and then... Blue all Ribbon the, uh, Award for Blue, him as well. And Best of Show Ribbon. Oh, um, that's so excellent. Outstanding little gardeners. And, and, and he's a third grader? He's a third grader, Gosh. yeah. If but, I'd have uh, started in third grade, imagine. Yeah, <laughs> and Lowell uh, had their Harvest Festival today. And okay. Myers Wilkins are having theirs tonight, so lots of fun things going on. And, and as Bob mentioned, sort of this renaissance or this interest again in doing that. And, and certainly for those of us that are a little older gardener, uh, seeing kids involved with gardening and enjoying that, that thing that we are fascinated it's with. It's so encouraging, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's really great to see. Thanks for sharing those, Tom. Yep. Well, now here's a look at uh, a before and after. Um, and the speed with which the season comes. We received this photo from Nancy Thompson of Morgan Park early this spring when she was doing some yard prep. Well, a couple weeks ago, she sent these shots of the fence overgrown with squash that she grew. It's uh, delicata squash, and she grew some heirloom pumpkins. Nancy says uh, that uh, her truck disappears in the driveway behind all the growth that she gets. and. Uh, her sunflower is a volunteer, and uh, she has some Joe Pieweed. Boy, they grew taller than the chicken coop in her yard. So just uh, an example, and uh, pretty amazing to think about how fast things grow from month to month. That's great, and we know Nancy, and uh, is the solution just to uh, take out the entire front yard and start over every year? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly get out the grass out and do all plants is a good yeah, thing. So. Yeah, well, she had some real success, and we thank her for sharing those pictures with us. Time now to take you on a tour of a lovely and lovingly cared for spread of gardens along the south shore of Lake Superior. Hi, I'm Ellen. I live in Cornucopia. Welcome to my garden. These are two of the Northern Lights azaleas. The pink one is the one that's called Northern Lights, I think. It's a hot pink. There's another one over further that you know of. And this one is the Mandarin Lights. And as I was pointing out earlier, the two orange ones over there by the hot pink one are also Mandarin Lights, but because of the degree of sunshine they get and the acid in the soil, they're all slightly different colors. This rose right over here, the Harrison yellow, which you can't tell is yellow because it's not open, was one of the first roses that came west with the pioneers. It blooms massively, but only once. Big yellow roses that are very fragrant. And these are a pink rose right here, also sort of raggedy, wilder kind of rose. This is the trolleus, and this is the cheddar trolleus, the black in front of the yellow I like. I started by planting things that I liked that I found in ditches. <laughs> so my husband calls it the ditch garden. And then those little by little gave way to nicer cultivars and I started starting things from seed. It's sort of, you know, how anybody gardens, I think, where you put things in, you wait and the next year you say, okay, that was too tall or that wasn't supposed to be that color or that bloomed earlier than I thought. And then you yank them up and rearrange them. So those poppies just come up. Again, I just pull those out because they end up being the whole garden. So they're pretty, but I have planted the big um, fancy oriental poppies that are not quite open. You'll see some of those. We have really good soil and it's very loamy. It's different throughout the yard and I mulch heavily with cedar. These volunteer, the nodding trillium, and so do the ferns of this kind. I have the Diablo, the Copertina, the new amber one, the Center Glow, the little Diablo, and lots of those big yellow ones. I love having different colors of foliage together. The yellow barberry with the dark nine bark, it's really a nice combination. Tree peonies, every year it makes a few, one or two big flowers like that, which I think are gorgeous. One thing I like about gardens is 
they have a sentimental value in that a lot of the stuff I have here are things that people gave me. These beautiful purple blue ones are from one of my best friends, Vicki. All of these peonies are dug up from my stepdaughter's garden. Um, the lupin volunteered. They're not the wild native lupin. These are all garden cultivars. So you like to have kind of cascading blooms and then in the meanwhile have all kinds of colored foliage to keep it pretty when nothing's blooming. Basically, I just want everything to keep growing and I would like it to be solid garden. Yes, thanks to Ellen and Cornucopia. Tom, you remember we were there right. earlier in the spring when she had all kinds of pulmonaria and primrose and daffodils. daffodils yeah. And um, it was a beautiful spring garden Yeah, as well. just this little garden kind of tucked in. in a yeah, place you wouldn't that, expect to see it. No. And then you walk in the backyard and it's like, whoa. Yeah, <laughs> it was really beautiful. Yeah. And, and seeing it in the summer, you know, it, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to reflect again on, on how good a season it was and we see it through the flowers. Yeah, so. I, I really think with the daylight we get, we don't really have to take a back seat to anyone. She did such a beautiful job there. And she mentioned the fact, some of the sentimental value and so many people, uh, it brings back memories and bring back memory of loved ones and neighbors and good friends. And there's a lot of real nice aspects to gardening. She's done yeah. a marvelous job. Yes, indeed. All right, more questions from our viewers. Shirley in Duluth has a huge bushy forsythia how do I prune it? Well, forsythia is going to be jump out real early in the spring, and uh, we've now got some great uh, winter hardy varieties that we never had before, but she'll prune right after the bloom, and uh, she doesn't want to get too aggressive. We don't want to get down to the woody stalks. Let it bloom, and then come right into your shears. And prune so now is way too late. Not too late. You don't want to be pruning now. Those flower buds are setting up at this time. Okay. Uh, Patty from Cloquet is wondering, how long can you leave root vegetables in the ground? <laughs> Well, I'm going to show you. You can leave them in all winter because I'll uh, show you uh, some slides of that here in the future. But uh, you've got to make sure you get either a heavy snow cover or they have to be mulched in very thoroughly. And then you want to make sure that you've got them marked because I've left them in and lost them in the snow and not knowing where I was going to be digging. Oh. So <laughs> a real heavy mulch and snow layer and they can go uh, through much of the season actually. Okay. And a lot of folks do that with their carrots and we'll harvest them throughout the winter. Again, as long as you get good snow cover or good mulch layer over the top of them. So. But mark them, as I say, because yeah. I've uh, done a lot of unnecessary sho snow shoveling and digging looking. <laughs> and you're the better for it. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Thank you. I need the winter exercise. Um, Tom, I know you've planted a lot of trees ar around the city and, and elsewhere, but Walt from Superior wants to know if he should use fertilizer stakes around his trees every year or every other year, or maybe not. Um, the answer to that is C. Um, neither. Those really are not effective and there, there are better ways to fertilize that tree than uh, the stakes. Really, those are, are very concentrated in a small area, do a great job fertilizing the lawn right where those stakes have gone into the ground. So there are better things to do or better ways to do that. So, And generally, once our trees are established, you generally don't need to do any additional fertilizing for them to be healthy. So. Sure. We would agree with that, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> you guys right. are on the same page. That's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's a question from um, Paul and Darcy who have a plum tree. They just moved to their house in August. The tree has leaves, many purple plums on about half the branches, but the other branches are bare. Wondering about blockage maybe from a pine tree, uh, you know, block, pine tree blocking the sun, and wondering if they should prune off the dead branches and when. Well, if they're dead is dead, and uh, it doesn't make too much difference when you're going to be pruning them, so they can come off. Now, it may be sun. Uh, plums, prunus, tends to be very uh, vulnerable to a lot of fungal disease as well. So uh, if, the, if the limbs are pliable, I'd let them go, and I'd prune them when they're dormant. But if they're actually dead, she can take them off right now. All right. We have a couple um, questions that came in via email. What's the best way to protect... Uh, an everlasting hydrangea. 
Um, generally shouldn't need to, but okay. again, uh, if they choose to, just a good mulch layer around it or a burlap will do okay with it um, or deer fencing. The biggest problem with, with a lot of our shrubs in the wintertime, as long as we're choosing hardy stock, is really the, the predators, whether it's rabbits or deer or things like that. So wrapping it with uh, burlap or fencing it to protect it, if, if that's a concern, would be the, the biggest thing that I would um, worry about with that. So. Okay. You know, I think one mistake that we make, we kind of kill them with kindness. If you've got woody stem tissue that you want to bring through the winter and then you surround it with straw, you cr create an environment that's conducive to mole and field mice damage and so forth. So if you, if you are going to actually mulch things in, leave a little space between that stem and the straw. Mm -hmm. All right. Sounds good. We will get back to more questions, but uh, we need to move on a little bit. And uh, we're happy to receive photos of garden displays, plants, and flowers from all across the region so we can share them with you. Here's tonight's Grow and Show. Our friends in the Upper Peninsula got their share of rain this season, yet the gardens of Lena Constantini of Ironwood, Michigan flourished. Lena says the blooms of the hydrangea bowed it down to the ground. And earlier, her tree peony displayed some 50 blossoms. The gardens feature bold colored iris and bright hibiscus with animal visitors coming to call. Lena says the space is shared by winged friends and frilly flowers that comfortably coexist. It's even served as a birthplace for baby fawns. Kelly Ritter Spawn of Duluth was thrilled to see mixed perennials, including the pink lupin, in bloom all summer long near a pot of bright annuals. Here's one for the record books. Judy V of Duluth Lakeside planted this showy lady slipper after purchase from a local nursery in 1998. 18 years later, the bloom debuted in June of 2016. Jan Stanislawski shares the yellow lady slippers that show themselves at her place near Barnum, along with this shocking pink azalea she calls Dr. Seuss. From Terry Aiken in Superior, a Shimanishki tree peony that comes to bloom in mid-June. From George and Dorothy Jameson of Sandstone, some columbine, iris, and early blooming tulips. And a cheery pot of yellow and red in the backyard garden of Jane Hicks of Ely. If you have garden photos to share, send them to 632 Niagara Court, Duluth, or even better, email them to greatgardening at wdse.org and let us show what you grow. And keep those pictures coming in. We're going to need some for next season. And uh, in particular, pictures of how your vegetable gardens did. People love to share the beautiful flower pictures, and we love to get them. But we don't have to often see a lot, of, uh, a lot of photos of vegetables. So Vegetables are more boring, except for those of us that really like to eat. Yeah, they're good <laughs> to eat. They're good to eat, that's for Can sure. Can we comment about Judy V? 18 years till it, it flowered. Uh, that's Judy, some patience. That is patience. Wow. We can all learn a little something. Yeah, yeah that's right. And, and Judy, of course, is a great gardener in the, in the Lakeside neighborhood. Okay, so. you guys know her. I, yeah. I haven't seen her garden, but I'll have to look it up now. Um, here's another question that came in via email, and it's from John. He's wondering about his tomatillas for the past couple years. The plant's been huge, lots of, uh, what do you call the? The blooms? Or blossoms? Latines is what he said. Or okay. I yeah. don't know. Uh, no fruit, though. Um, he's, he said there were a lot of bees, but does he need two plants to produce the fruit? No. You know, I don't think so. All that vegetative growth, I'm wondering if, uh, what's he fertilizing with? What have we got? Maybe a little more information. I don't would have be that there. information, back, but um, back off on the nitrogen. Make sure you got plenty of potassium, and let's try to get some fruit to set and get it in early. Okay. Uh, and I've uh, had the pleasure of sh shucking, shucking them. those uh, ground cherries or uh, tomatillos, and they're a lot of fun and very delicious. They to are eat. good. People love them, but yeah, yeah there's a l little bit of work involved. Yeah, in and outstanding in a pie. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 All right. Okay. This is from Tom in Washburn. He has wild blueberries and is wondering should uh, any type of fertilizer be applied to them in the fall? Never. 
Uh, we don't want to fertilize. We want them just to gradually come into a dormant state. Little fertility in the spring after the uh, leaves are already out and our set would be fine. Okay. Um, from uh, Gary, he's building, well, he sent this a little while ago, but was building a, a 12 by 20 by 2 inch deep raised bed vegetable garden and wanted to know the right amount of ingredients for an excellent garden soil. Well, uh, I wonder if it two inch it is actually two, two feet. feet. Oh, it is two feet. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. So, yeah. so it's a, yeah. <laughs> There's just one, yeah, there's just one, one little sl sl instead of two. two. 12 the by eyes 20 of a little by bit two <laughs> feet. Thank you. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> anyway, what's the answer? Well, good, uh, good organic content yeah. in that um, is really the key, I believe. So. Okay. Yeah, he's got to go, he's got to put together a mix there and get a combination of good mineral soil up. Uh, a lot of, uh, particularly raised beds, they'll use a lot of potting soil mixes, which are peat-based, and we miss some of the uh, trace nutrients that are in uh, mineral soils. So really wants to spend a little time and just put together a comprehensive soil and get it soil tested, see what the pH is, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and he's got it. But he will spend a little time making up a good mix. Okay. Organics maybe, as maybe well Maybe it was as a fairy garden, so. two inches no. <laughs> 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 All right, John Doe from the USA. Oh, that was, this is another one about the tomatillas. Um, I think that might be the same one. He sent it via email and then called. Okay, Mary Johnson, what's the tiny, tiny fly that ruins gladiolas? How do I control it for next year? Well, uh, th the big problem with gladiolas is actually a thrip. Um, it's a very, very small insect, almost microscopic, mm -hmm. um, and they really do damage to the buds and to the uh, leaf tissue of the foliage. So the uh, best thing she can do is actually, if she's grown those gladiolas in the same spot for years and years, is to move them to another spot in the garden or stop growing them for a couple of years because the thrip population does build up over time. So. so does she need to get rid of those bulbs? Yeah, it's really good to start over. Okay. Um, they probably are not going to—they're not going to overwinter on those bulbs. But it's good if if they've struggled, or she's had problems, to probably start fresh. Great thing about gladiolas is they're very, very cheap, so yeah. she can buy them inexpensively and have beautiful flowers. So. Excellent. Yeah, they are gorgeous. Okay, Mike from Carlton has deformed potatoes. Uh, he grew Yukons and russets, and some were rotted inside. All were unusable. What happened? That's a good question. It's a good potato region. Uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about the deformity and what mm -hmm. he means by that. The fact that some of the, some of the flesh was rotted. Um, we have when we have all this moisture, we have a lot of hollow heart that occurs, and then the flesh begins to rot around that. Um, I, I think he wants to go back again and look at drainage. He wants to look at uh, his soil test. We have to have adequate potassium. Our soils tend to be very deficient in potassium. That's uh, really required for good tuber set. So. I'd say drainage, a good quality stock, uh, foundation seed stock, certified uh, disease-free, and then taking a hard look at nutrients, in particular potassium. Here's a, here's a similar question, Pam and Mattawa. What caused holes in my red potatoes? I used peat when I planted. You know, if the holes are on the outside, which I'm assuming, uh -huh. it's a little hard to tell here, but uh, I mentioned we've got some cavities, would be a little different. Holes on the outside actually can be uh, grub damage. We see mm -hmm. quite a bit of that, uh, June beetle uh, larvae damage. And then we can see uh, scab, if it's very severe, we'll leave a pocked hole as well on the outside. Okay. Mary from Duluth wants to know why your Japanese lilac did not bloom this year. She's had the plant about five years. Um, not that real uncommon to see Japanese tree lilacs take a break. Um, and you'll see where uh, mature, even mature Japanese tree lilacs will sometimes not bloom every year, so I, it's nothing to panic about, and really um, much more common than people realize, so not to worry. Okay. Um, do we have time for one more quick one? Well, we, we have one more segment of questions, so we'll, we'll uh, move on and then we'll get back to questions in just a bit. But right now we have to talk about chores. It's a chore, but we must. So let's look at some of what needs to be done now to ensure greater success next season. And I know you guys uh, came up with a list of chores. Let's go through those real yeah. quickly. First one is plant and transplant trees and shrubs, water until ground freezes. Fall's a great time to be doing that, both the planting, so if you're still able to get to the nursery 
and purchase uh, those trees and shrubs, good time to get them in the ground. Again, making sure that they get good water. Also transplanting, so if there's a, a plant you need to move, now is a good time. Uh, of course, trees within reason, you don't really wanna take off or try to do anything too large. Instead, concentrate on a smaller tree that you can easily transplant and, and do well, so. And the second point, seeding the lawn. Now, that's an early fall activity. Uh, we don't want to go too late there because the seedlings can be damaged if they don't get established. So uh, that might be a project you want to wrap up by this weekend, but certainly we can put sod right up until it, uh, it freezes. But if you miss this window to seed, uh, early next spring is going to be your next uh, opportunity. Uh, and uh, great time as we uh, roll a little bit later into the fall, cut back or cut down those perennials most of them and unless you're leading, leaving things up if it's perennial grasses or seed heads that you want to attract uh, birds to your landscape you can keep those up but but a great time to if you've dealt with uh, disease or insect problems good time to get that stuff cut out and out of the garden and into the compost pile so That's great planting next year's garlic good activity but we're still way too early um, okay you want to get the garlic in and you want it to start to get the roots established you don't want that uh, that sprout to emerge or it can be damaged, you want it to emerge next spring. So Same really with those flower bulbs then too? Too early yep, for too that? Early. Yeah, too early, we want to look at, clean up the weeds right now. If you've got mm -hmm. perennial weeds in those areas, so get your bed prepared. If you're going to soil test, let's get some phosphorus, potassium in the ground at this particular time. And then let's, uh, let's look at October 15th to November 1 to really plant uh, some of these other uh, spring flowering bulbs or garlic. Okay, um, and then do you guys, recommend leaves to mulch with? Uh, sure. sure. I think they're fine. If, if you're going to, uh, I prefer to leave them in a, uh, a pillow pack, mm -hmm. a, uh, a garbage bag. The problem with leaves, if you want insulation, they can compact on you and then you don't have any insulating value. Oh, okay. So you want the loft there and uh, the best way is to keep them dry in a, a pillow pack with a, a garbage bag and then they do a very nice job as a winter mulch. Right. And, and certainly if you're dealing with some of the disease problems we talked about sure. earlier with uh, some of that foliage, uh, rather than using it as compost or, or keeping it around, maybe getting it out of the garden or in, out okay. of the Okay, clean and take care of those tools. And we only have one more minute for questions, so let's try to get to these. Okay. Uh, Mary Intrigo has a Virginia Bower climber. How can I get rid of it? Uh, Virginia creeper more than likely is what she means, uh, which is the vine we talked about. Oh, Very okay. aggressive. Yeah. Pulling it out by the root. Just yank it out. Okay. Yeah. And then mm. do it a second time. <laughs> Marty from Duluth has grape vines with a cottony kind Ooh. of growth covering the grapes. The ba they're beta grapes. Mm -hmm. Grapes get hard. Can they be used? Uh, yeah. If you can use them, but uh, severe powdery mildew, we saw more of that this year. As temperatures warm, I think we're going to see even more of that. So. We might have to look at some kind of fungicidal control to get uh, successfully grow grapes in the future. Nothing you can do at this point. Okay. Uh, Tracy and Hibbing, her garden's filled with all types of weeds and grasses. What can be done to help for next year? Uh, getting out into that garden, Tracy. Unfortunately, uh, because she's got other plants around it, pretty difficult to control if she wanted to use a pesticide, mm -hmm. uh, like an all-purpose type of uh, cleanup. So getting out, pulling those weeds by hand, doing a good job of it. That's the, been one of the great things about this year is we've had a lot of moisture. So the weeds have not only grown well, but they're a little easier to pull sure. out as well. What about, now we saw earlier in that video with Liz DeLuca, she put black plastic down or tarp down. That can be helpful. Yeah. Um, I think you're gonna have to take it up, you know, annually really. Sure, and, uh, but, but it, over the winter would it It's an it option. Help? The other thing, if she's got a lot of weeds now, no, we'd wanna get it up first. Let's go back down in the spring. Oh, okay. You gotta till, you gotta modify, but more than likely she's gonna have a lot of weed seed yet. So she's gonna to have to be alert next spring, shallow cultivation, a little bit of the old ho, 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 huh, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> one more quick one, Martian to Harbor says all her tomatoes split on the vine. Yeah, we saw a lot of that. That's What's the that excessive water. The water, she said, is that due to uneven watering? And We just had, uh, nature was naturally a little sure. bit uneven. Some varieties are much more vulnerable. Make a note of that, try to avoid those, because I think we're gonna see a lot of this moisture continuing into the future. All right. Well, over the summer, we got out and about to meet and learn from gardeners and growers who were doing some pretty cool things, which we will expand on next season. But right now, here's a preview. For a look at how lake residents and businesses in Northwest Wisconsin are restoring shoreland with native plantings, we take you to Lake Minising. 
in Hermantown, a Christmas tree farm that's been operating for generations is still going strong with skilled practices in evergreen tree management. These stunning peonies of all shapes and handsome hues are grown in Duluth and displayed for admirers and those who hope to grow their own. An accomplished rose hybridizer takes us on a tour of her rose farm and test center where science and nature meet with some wondrous results. And we visit a vast and vital private vineyard outside of Barnum, where some of the hardiest and tastiest grapes in Minnesota are grown. All that, plus garden tours across the region and expert advice on growing, next season on Great Gardening. All right, all that coming up and much more. We're already gearing up for next year. One item on the calendar, though, for this fall, Bob, you wanted to tell us about this uh, Garden Fest. Garden Fest, we're going to take a look at the year of the carrot. We always have a good time with this. Uh, going to have a discussion on the 18th, both growing and then preparing carrots. We have a celebrated celebrity chef that's going to join us for the evening. Mm -hmm. And I recruited him. And you won't tell him, us who it is. I recruited him because he makes an absolutely wicked carrot cake. Ooh, Wonderful. Love that we have stuff. a contest for people, too. If they want to enter a carrot dessert, uh, just contact the Extension Service. We'll take entries from the public. Sounds well. like a lot of fun. Okay. For all the latest events and information, or even to watch past episodes of the show, go to our website, wdse.org slash gardening. You'll see that list of uh, trees and shrubs for replacement. You'll see the fall chores. You'll see a lot of things on there that uh, will help you finish out the season. But guess what? That's all the time we have left for this whole hour. A crazy amount of information we got out there. And uh, you guys were excellent answering questions and uh, give us such great advice all the time. We really really appreciate your uh, your help and your advice. Uh, now we were all a nervous wreck going into the show. <laughs> Brand new to us and just yes. a lot of <laughs> nerves and we did okay. We, we did, did okay. Yep. Our, pro did. our producer handles all that, takes all the weight off our you shoulders. Did so well. we just get in there and show up, don't we? Yeah, that's right, Bob. Uh, <laughs> before we go, we also want to say thank you and goodbye to uh, one of our sponsors, Swanson Greenhouses in Eveleth. They will be closing their doors at the end of this season on October October 29th for a well-deserved retirement after 31 years in business. So uh, thank you and uh, goodbye to them. We'll miss them very much. Salute to Gail and Irwin. They've done just a marvelous job and community the, uh, really contributed so much to the community on the range. You, absolutely. Thanks, of course, to our phone volunteers, the St. Louis County Master Gardeners. We are back for our 2017 spring special on March 9th. It's it will be here before you know it, but until then, from all of us here, thanks for watching and enjoy the garden.